Oh, it's not. 
Couldn't take it anymore. End of my road. But God. Amen? There was a time that we spent quite a bit of time praying for our son, who was away from the Lord, was addicted to drugs. It felt like there was no hope that Henny wanted to keep keep you feeling like there wasn't hope. But every time I turned around, the Lord was in my face with a message. Don't you quit praying. Don't you give up. And we kept praying. Even when it was hard. And the Lord answered that prayer. There was a time I was in so much pain from migraines on a daily basis that my prayer became, Lord, take me home. I, I don't want to do this anymore. But God answered that prayer. Amen? So it doesn't matter what the situation is. When you feel like giving up, there is always hope in Jesus. Amen? And I'm going to tell you this. This is the exciting part. The anointing that is coming from being through it is better and deeper and stronger than the pain you go through to get it. Amen? The anointing that you get from going through something like that to be able to minister to somebody else is better than the pain you go through. So if that's you now or in the future, keep that in your mind. This isn't the end of the story. This isn't the end of the rope. There is hope. Jesus is our hope. Amen? He's our anchor. I love that. He's our anchor. And so that's my just my encouragement to you today. So I just want you to know that there will be people that will pray for you, to encourage you, to help you. And if you're going through something, find somebody who has the anointing and something you've already been through to partner with you in prayer and encouragement. Amen? Amen. I just want to say, I don't know if you all recognize the keyboard player this week. Can I give a big shout out to Dave for joining us? Didn't you do fabulous? Thank you, Dave. We love seeing Dave here. We have some announcements. Please check them out. Good morning, I am Destiny Inglehart, and on behalf of Redeeming Love Christian Embassy, we welcome and thank you for spending part of your weekends here with us. If you are new or just tuning in, it is great to have you. You can text rlce.welcome to the number 57838, or you can scan the QR code with your cell phone to fill out our online connection card. Now here's some announcements to help us all stay connected. If you are in college or just starting into your career as a young adult, then this class is for you. The college and career class will meet each Thursday at 7 o'clock p.m. at Pastor Darlene's home located at 5573 West Spring Knoll Drive. Invite a friend and get ready to grow in Christ. Thank you to those who volunteered to make the Mega Sports Camp a success. We appreciate you investing in the lives of the children here in Bay City. Speaking of children, our annual Back to School Bash is coming to Bangor Downs on Wednesday, August 11th. School is soon to begin and we want to help area children with the basic school supplies. Your donation of $10 will enable children to have a backpack, crayons, markers, colored pencils, glue, pencils, erasers, and two notebooks. Text RLCE to the number or place your donation in an envelope and mark bash on it. Do you desire to be baptized? Great! We are planning an all-church picnic and baptism on Sunday, August 8th at the Heathcote Park in Saginaw. From 4 o'clock p.m. to 6 o'clock p.m., please see the sign-up list at the hospitality table for food and beverages. For those desiring to be baptized, there is a sign-up for an informational meeting with Pastor Rick. If you didn't know, we are raising funds to build or to purchase our own building to be used as an event center and church. We are off to the next goal of $750,000. Here are a few convenient ways to give. Scan this QR code from your cell phone or text RLCE to the number 73256 or place your gift in the envelope marked building on it and mail it to 3012 East Midland Road, Bay City, Michigan 48706. You can renew your pledge, make a new pledge, or help us with fundraisers. Thank you for your continued financial support to RLCE. Your partnership allows us to be agents of change both here as well as around the world by supporting our vibrant ministries, outreaches, and worldwide mission programs and orphanages. 
Giving has never been easier. You can securely give from your mobile device by texting RLCE to the number 73256 or simply scan this QR code with your cell phone. Offering baskets are also on each side of the stage as well as in the foyer for those giving their tithes and offerings in person. Feel free to place your offering envelopes at any one of these locations during our greeting time. At this time, the children are dismissed to go next door to our secure United Way Family Center. Nursery is open for children ages 3 and under in the mezzanine each Sunday except the first Sunday of each month. Those desiring to give your tithes and offerings may do so at this time with containers located to the left and to the right of the stage. Feel free to take a moment to greet one another. Our next announcements will resume shortly. And now please welcome. Well, good morning. You know, I, I would just echo the sentiments uh, that it's, you know, it's, it's nice to see Dave and Joy here this morning. Honestly, it's nice to see all of you here this morning. Amen? I absolutely am thrilled that I get to spend part of your Sunday and my Sunday together. Because, you know, the truth is, is really, we are absolutely better together. Do you, do you believe that this morning, church? That was really pathetic. <laughs> Woo! We are better together. Right. We absolutely are better together. And I absolutely 100% agree with that. And, and honestly, the more this year has gone by, the more that really has, has really sunk into my heart concerning, you know, how much better I am with having all of you folks in my life. And I, I absolutely mean that. 100 percent i mean you know one of the things that uh, that i've talked about in years past you know i i like to do a garden you know it's one of the things that i've enjoyed over the years just to just kind of get my mind off of things and i didn't, I didn't do a garden last year i just i just i felt off right how many people kind of felt off last year i felt really off last year i just didn't feel like doing a garden but this year you know i just really like doing the garden, and I'm happy to report to you that the garden is doing phenomenal. <laughs> it really is. It's doing like my tomato plants. Anybody got any tomato plants this year? Ooh, ooh. ooh man, I tell you what. My, now I know I'm not really tall, so people like Shane don't laugh at me. But my tomato plants are literally as tall as I am. I'm like so geeked about it. They're like humongous. I picked my first red cherry tomato yesterday. Tried giving it to the wife. She didn't want it, so. Good. He was good. But anyway, you didn't come here to hear me talk about my garden, but I could talk about it a little bit more because it really is doing that good. But you know, one of the other things that Nikki and I actually enjoy doing and getting ready for springtime, you know, you, you get out of that winter doldrums and just you're kind of ready for life, right? You're ready just to see things get green, you're ready for springtime, you're ready for flowers. So we we actually like to plant flower. I actually like to plant flowers on the back deck with my two little helpers up here in the front, Maddie and, and Rianne. We usually plant the flowers on the, the back deck. We just enjoy that all summer long. So Nikki and I will enjoy those on, on the back deck. But we also like to plant flowers. We buy hanging flowers. I can't say plant flowers. We like to buy hanging flowers and put it on the front porch just because it, it kind of spruces up the place. It looks good. You know, we enjoy walking, you know, up to the front of the house and we and we see that, you know. But the one thing that, that gives me is every year, you know, birds absolutely love those hanging plants as well too. And one of the things that I'm challenged with is is usually, you know, depending on the depending on when I get the, the hanging con plants put up, you know, the birds will usually take ownership of one of the plants. And then it gets kind of hard to try and, you know, water the flowers around these bird nests and stuff. You know, it's kind of a challenge. Sometimes if I don't get the plants hung up early enough for the birds, they'll take advantage of this. I think he has this, this imitation planter that's kind of hanging along uh, the siding near the front door. And the birds absolutely love using that as a nesting ground for uh, for them. And and there's usually some pretty stiff competition, you know, when they actually when they actually get the uh, first first tabs at that. And I actually prefer that they do it because then I don't have to try and fight around the, the bird's nest and the hanging uh, hanging plants in. 
Um, and this year was absolutely no different. We had we had these couple robins that built a nest in this, this imitation hanging plant, whatever you want to call it, that was up against the house. And the you know the mama bird actually you know had three eggs in that nest area. And you know we kind of like to, to try and keep an eye on that from a distance. Well, one afternoon Nikki called me out to the front porch and she says. You know, the, the birds had hatched, and they had these little chicks in the in the nest, and one of the birds had fallen out of the nest, right? So, and it was just, I mean, it was just a little hatchling. I mean, it probably wasn't more than a few days old. It was, it was pretty, it was pretty little. Just, you know, Nikki, you know, bless her heart, the heart that she had, she's like, well, it, it, I could pick it up and just put it back in the nest. Do you think it would be okay? You know, I said, well, honey, it's, the little guy's kind of in rough shape. He's kind of, he's kind of really suffering. I said, I said, besides that, I said, if you put him in the nest, I said, you know, there's a chance that maybe the mom rejects the rest of the entire nest. I said, you don't, you don't really know. I said, well, why, don't, why don't you go ahead and go on in the house, and I'll take care of this. Um, I'll spare you really the rest of, of the details. But the little guy, the little guy was really suffering. So I don't suspect this was an accident. I think foul play was at work here. Yeah. Come on! Oh, brother. Thanks, Shane. I got a boo on that one even. Wow! Who snorted? I, you're my favorite. You're my favorite now. Another one. All right, so. But here's, here's my point, is honestly, that kind of scenario really isn't all that uncommon, right? In fact, in nature, it's fairly common, and they actually have a term for it. It's called, it's called, um, it's called nest civil side. Nest civil side. And it, and it actually happens when a family member will intentionally kill another family member, and they usually do it for kind of their own survival. So you can have a couple different scenarios. The, uh, the siblings in the nest can do that. If, if they feel like there's too much competition for their own natural food resources, so sometimes they'll just kind of kick the weaker sibling out of the nest, and that's probably what happened here. You can also, it can also happen where maybe if the food resources are are kind of scarce and you know they can't really find enough food sometimes maybe the mama bird will actually kick out one of you know the fledglings just because they want to make sure that they preserve as many of, of the other uh, chicks as they possibly can i don't think that this was the case just because every time that i would go out into you know to water the, the plant because that's kind of my job is watering the plants out front you know, these robins were out in the front yard and there was like plenty of worms that they were getting. So I think it was the brothers that probably ganged up on the poor little guy and kicked the poor thing out, you know. And let's be honest, right? How, who has siblings in here? I might have siblings. I mean, let's be honest, siblings just fight, right? I mean, you just sometimes fight. I remember growing up, I had one brother and we fought constantly. I mean, constantly. In fact, it was really so bad that my, my father, who, who really wasn't church, he didn't really attend church on any kind of regular basis by any stretch of the imagination, but he, he did call us Cain and Abel. I mean, that's, he called us Cain and Abel probably more than he called us by our own names. And, and my dad, I've got a picture of, I just actually picked this picture just because I think it was kind of cool. You know, my dad was a police officer. It, my dad was the one holding the gun, just for the record. It's not, not, not the one that was in cuffs. But uh, he actually was a police officer uh, with the Bay City Police Department for, for the better part of, of 30 years. And so I decided to just kind of put a couple of pictures. He's passed on now, but that's one I always thought it was kind of cool just because, you know, it kind of looks like, you know, one of those 70s detective you know, television show is kind of pretty cool. And then there he is in, in his uniform. But anyway, you know, 
he and the other police officers, you know, they were all, they were all really pretty close. They were all really a pretty tight knit group. They would get together actually quite a bit. In fact, my parents would throw these pretty elaborate St. Patty's Day parties every year and all the police officers and their families would, would come and, you know, they just kind of celebrate, you know, together and they would, they would have fun together. So they, they all knew each other really pretty well. And I remember this one time, I was probably 16 or 17 years old. Now that's a, that's a, it's a picture of me. And I was in, I was in my, one of my, one of my, I call them newer cars. First car that I bought, it was a Toyota Celica. It was yellow and trust me, the color was very fitting because it really was a lemon, but I thought it looked cool. I thought it looked really nice. You know, I had a, had a moon roof, you know, and I could, I could drive around it. I remember one time I was driving around town and I got pulled over. It happened fairly frequently with me, to be honest with you. But on this particular occasion, I don't remember if I was speeding. I don't remember what the civil infraction was. I don't remember what it was. But Officer Penny pulled me over. And, you know, she didn't recognize me right away when, I, when, I, when, she, when she came to the door. You know, but she went through the typical, can I have your license and registration? And, and um, so I gave that to her. She looked at my license, and as soon as she looked at it, she said, Abel, what are you doing? My reputation proceeded. She knew who I was. She knew who we were. She knew us by Cain and Abel. I, I was Abel. Just so you know, my brother was Cain. I, I was Abel. So, you know. And thankfully, she actually let, yeah, she let me off. I didn't get a ticket. Um, sometimes it does pay to be the kid of a uh, police officer, for sure. And I don't think she even ever told my, I don't think she told my dad, because <laughs> I, my, I, I'm pretty sure if my dad knew about it, I, I would have felt it. I'll just leave it at that. But you know, like I said, even, even in, you know, normal unchurched circles, the story of Cain and Abel is pretty well known, right? That, you know, from a historical perspective, it's really the first recorded murder that that we have in history, right? I mean, it was recorded back. It's actually the, the first uh, human civil side situation that occurred, right? Because Cain killed his his brother. Let's let's pick that up just real quickly here in Genesis chapter four. You can take a look at at the screen behind me if you've got your smartphones or if you've got your Bible, you can turn to Genesis chapter 4. We're going to start out here in verse 1. It says, Now Adam had sexual relations with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant. When she gave birth to Cain, she said, With the Lord's help, I have produced a man. Later she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd, while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the first lambs in his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Why are you so angry, the Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right, but if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. One day Cain suggested to his brother, let's go out into the fields. And while they were in the fields, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Afterwards, the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother? Where is Abel? I don't know, Cain responded, am I my brother's guardian? But the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are cursed in your in now you are cursed and banished from the ground, which has swallowed your brother's blood. No longer will the ground yield good crops for you, no matter how hard you work. From now on you will be a homeless wanderer on the earth. You know, there have been tons and tons of different messages written about this particular situation, and you know, the majority of them really kind of come to the conclusion that God rejected Cain's offering because he didn't have the right attitude. He didn't have the right motives and in, in, in such. And, you know, I probably would, would tend to agree with that just based on 
the way you know Moses actually phrased certain portions of the scripture. You know, he talks about how how Cain brought some of his crops, while he really kind of accentuates the way Abel actually gave the first fruits, the very the very best of, of his lamb. So I think it's probably pretty safe to say that you know Cain you know didn't have necessarily the right attitude in his giving when it came to this offering, but. To be honest with you, the scripture really doesn't definitively say. It doesn't exactly say why did God reject Cain's offering and so pleased with with Abel's. Just really tells Cain that you know if you do well, you will be accepted. But I think, to me anyway, it's not really the point of the story anyway, right? It's just really not. Cain was so angered. He had so much anger in, in to the degree that he actually went out and, and killed his brother, right? He didn't understand the value that there was in, in family. Not at all. Now, whether it's because he didn't necessarily appreciate the value of family or he didn't necessarily appreciate where his position was in the family, you know, that's, that's something that we're not going to know on this side of heaven, right? But whatever the cause was, Cain had an awful lot of anger built up in, inside of him. He didn't necessarily appreciate his brother. And you know, when I think of, when I think of that term, you know, 20, 30 years ago, it was pretty common in the church that people would refer to one another as brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, you know. Um, Brother Bill and Sister Helen and those kind of things. That, you know, we don't really do that too much anymore. We we do have a, a few remnant that does it. I think of I think of Daniel back in the sound booth. I still hear Daniel refer to people as you know brother so and so and sister so and so. Honestly, it just it tickles my heart when I hear him do that, just because that's Daniel's heart. He just he has he has a heart for people, and, and when he says it, he says it with a sincerity because. He does absolutely value one another as brothers and sisters in Christ because that's truly what we are, right? And I'm not I'm not saying that I'm not saying that I necessarily was one that went around and saying, hello brother so and so or hello sister or so and so and that I wanted people to refer to me as that, but I do think that there was absolute value and there is absolute value because it reminds us of the value that we have in family. The value that we have in part of the family of God. And if I'm going to be honest with you, I, I, I feel to some extent that, that we've lost a little bit of that. Can I just be transparent with you folks? I feel like we've lost a little bit of that. You know, part of, part of that, you know, a lot of that, let's just be honest, has to do with, you know, a lot of what we went through last year, right? All of it. I think. I think a lot of what we went through last year just kind of accelerated some of the symptoms that were really already there. But you know, nowadays it's 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 kind of easy for people just to just to sit at home and do church by themselves. That's why, honestly, you know, I'm I'm excited that we're all here together this morning. And I know we've got some folks that are off on vacation or. Their very own apostle and their family are on vacation. And how many know that it's good to be able to refresh and be able to do those kind of things? So don't don't misunderstand my heart. That's not what I'm talking about. But I am talking about people that feel like they can do church by themselves. Because honestly, we can't. That that isn't how that isn't how Jesus intended for his church to be. Jesus didn't create a harem of churches. He created one church. And that's us. That's us. I, I, I get it. I mean, even, even us last year, you know, there was a certain time where we couldn't, we couldn't meet together, right? So, you know, we, we would, you know, record or live stream our, our services there. And, you know, I... There's a couple of weeks that I kind of liked it. I gotta be honest with you. You know, I would, you know, we'd turn down the living room there and, you know, we'd all come out there and if I needed a cup of coffee or refill, I could just go get a cup of coffee and a refill. 
It was kind of nice. But there was something missing. There was something missing. And, and, and that, isn't, that isn't doing church. And please hear my heart. I am, I am not here to, 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 to criticize or condemn anybody. I'm just sharing my heart with some things that, that I went through. And, and, and I hope that that will come across as, as, we, as we talk a little bit with each other this morning. But the church, it, it isn't healthy for us to just sit at home and think that we can turn the television on and put whatever preacher we happen to fancy or tickles our ear and listen to him. And if that doesn't, if that doesn't tickle our ear or doesn't tickle our fancy, well, I can just turn the channel because there'll probably be somebody else on another station that is going to probably be talking about something that you know, maybe makes me feel a little bit better. That, that isn't church. It's just not. And I'm not knocking, please understand me, I am not knocking the value of supplementing our learning and supplementing what we're hearing. There are, you ask my family, there are very, very few times that I really listen to the radio anymore. I, I normally have some type of podcast on where I'm listening to um, individuals that I get, you know, supplemented messages from, you know, there's there's usually a couple, and it doesn't really matter because, you know, we all have different preferences, and it's good for us to be able to supplement those kind of things. I also absolutely realize that we have folks here that 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 can't come because of health reasons and and, and those kind of reasons. So please understand my heart. I am not saying that there are not legitimate reasons why people can't actually come together as a church. But let's understand that we're not as effective together when we're separated. We're just not, because that is not how God intended for us to be. He just didn't. There's something, there's something significant about family and community, isn't there? And that's what this is. This is this is community. Community actually is a place where we can come together, to where we can grow and mature, to where we encourage one another. And yeah, even even to a certain extent, kind of stretch each other, right? How else are we going to grow and stretch if if we're not allowing one another to to grow and stretch? Just like. Scripture talks about iron sharpening iron, right? You think about you think about a blacksmith, and you think about what they do when they're actually when they're actually molding that piece of iron into something into a knife. And there's there's shavings that it's going on, right? They're they're actually taking off parts and pieces of metal. And at first, there's a fair amount of that that goes on, right? And then as they continue to hone that weapon, as they continue to hone that blade, it's it's, it's, it's less pieces and it's more refined, but there's still pieces that are being shaved off. There's friction and there's value in friction. Friction is healthy for us because honestly, if I'm just hanging out with people that I agree with everything they say or everything that they do, how is that stretching and how is that growing me? It's really not. That's what we're missing when we're not together. I think Jesus' prayer in John 17 really sums that up. He says, And I ask not only for these disciples, but also for those who will one day believe in me through their message. I pray for them all to be joined together as one, even as you and I, Father, are joined together as one. I pray for them to become one with the Father, so that the world will recognize that you sent me. See, the challenge that we have this morning if we truly, truly want to want to see the kingdom expanded, then that community starts here and it starts now. See the see the building of that isn't dependent upon the building that we're in. We are not going to be any more effective making community in building one another up in a multi-million dollar new facility. It's just going to have different walls around it. And I am excited to be able to, to see the vision 
that, that, that lies ahead for us. So don't misunderstand me. A church, it doesn't matter what walls we find ourselves in. We can't wait till we have a different facility or we have different conditions in order for us to get together. We have to press in and we have to press forward. Amen? So the question is, how do we do that this morning? How do we do that? And it's not rocket science. I think the writer of Hebrew really gives us three good points that I'd, I'd like us to, to really kind of get into our spirit and emphasize this morning. We find it in Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25. It says this, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his Return is drawing near. Three simple points. The first point that the writer of Hebrew makes is motivate one another to acts of love and good works. You see, families motivate one another with love and support. Regardless. You know, this, this week I had I had the, the honor of, of going in uh, ministering out at Teen Challenge. And that's something that I used to do quite a bit, quite honestly. They, they stopped inviting uh, different speakers and ministers to come out when, uh, when COVID hit last year. But I would, I would go out there every, you know, every couple, couple months there, whenever they would ask me. Um, and, and let me tell you, it just it did my heart so much good to go out there and just to spend some time with those folks this past week because I absolutely love and honor the heart that the ministry has in the leadership of that ministry. And that's a ministry, honestly, that's always going to be near and dear. You know, Nikki, Nikki mentioned it earlier, and she, quite honestly, she didn't know what I was going to be preaching on this morning, but she made, she made mention of that because that ministry is something that is just very dear and precious to our entire family. And I'm not going to go into all of the details of it because it's not necessarily my testimony to give, but how it affected me and my family is my testimony to, to share. And I would, just, I would just submit this to you. When we were... When we had made the decision as a family, and Ryan agreed to go into Team Challenge, we purposed that we were going to do this together, that we were going to do this as a family. So we were very intentional uh, in, in united in, in taking him. I remember that we all got together as a family. We were missing Maddie that night, of course, I don't remember what was going on there. We went together and we all went out to dinner, and, and the, the picture that you see on, on the left here, actually, we, we all went together, and I think it was just the Outback, I don't, I don't really remember where we went, but we went out and we ate a meal together, and we just shared some moments together. And then when we got, then when we got done with our meal, together as a family, we drove to the men's center to, to be able to take him there. And we, when we got into the, to the house of the men's center, the, the office or the intake is in the very back section of, of the men's center. So you have to literally walk through the house to be able to get to the office. And, and we all walked in together. I wasn't doing real good. I wasn't doing real good at that time. And we walked into the kitchen dining area where all of the students were actually they were studying here. As we were walking past, the Holy Spirit used one of the students who just looked up. He looked up to Ryan and said, Welcome to the family. Ryan. It's for me as a dad. 
Because I knew that he was in the right place. And I knew that the thing that he needed, the thing that he needed ministering, more so than an addiction, was understanding the value that somebody has and where that fits in with family. Church, that is the same purpose of the Father for us as part of His family. That is His heart. And that doesn't mean everything was going to be perfect. That doesn't mean everything went perfect at the men's center. Trust me, because we were uh, we were pretty close to all of those all of those uh, individuals, and and there was some tough times. But God did a working in that situation. We're so thankful for that. But in that moment, that was to me in that moment one of the most perfect examples of community that I have ever witnessed, even to this day. Because love and support is what community and family is all, is all about, regardless. Regardless. Amen? The second point in Hebrews says this, let us not neglect our meeting together. Families connect. That's what families do, right? At least families that have intentions of doing life together. You know, this is an area, honestly, that, you know, Nikki has had to work pretty hard with, with me out. My, my normal tendency is I, I, I'm kind of okay. I'm kind of okay with just spending time with Nikki and the kids and the family. And I'm kind of okay with it. I mean, you know, even even last year when, when the pandemic hit, it was, it was, it was kind of nice, kind of setting aside some of the things that I, you know, was normally involved in, whether it was, whether it was Teen Challenge or, you know, whether it was going out to the, the, the Saginaw prison once a week or whether it was family ministries here at the embassy, whatever it was, you know, all of that kind of stuff was, was kind of put on hold and it kind of, I felt good for a little bit. I gotta be honest with you. And it kind of was nice just being able to just being able to spend time with Nikki and away from from everything for a while. How many know, you know, that's that's okay for a season, right? This isn't a trick question. It is okay for a season. It is okay for a season. In fact, scripture talks about how Jesus would often go into the wilderness to pray. He would often go into the wilderness to pray. The challenge with that is Jesus always returned back to where the people were to minister. I wasn't quite as ready to, to leave that wilderness. I kind of like just, you know, just being with Nikki and, you know, spending spending time with her and doing some of those kind of things. But how many know that's not where that's not where growth happens? It just, it just isn't. You know, I think about, you know, when I was, you know, when I first came to know the Lord, when I was first growing up in the Lord, there were some, there were some influential people in our lives that made such an impact for us. You know, Nikki mentioned it earlier. Again, she didn't know what we were preaching, what I was preaching on. But she mentioned how our marriage was, was, was not only rough, it was just downright ugly. And we're pretty transparent about those kind of things because we know how they can minister to other marriages that are struggling and we know what God did in our marriage and we know that if He can do that in our marriage, He can do it in anybody's marriage. And we were really in a bad place. We were really struggling. And, and when we first came to know the Lord, the very first thing that we did was we got plugged into a couple that we are so grateful for Bill and Debbie Berger were putting on a, a marriage class that allowed us to be able to grow and be able to connect with people. And that made such an impact not only on our marriage, but it made an impact in our in our family. You see, those people did community with us, those people connected with us. The other thing that I think about 
The other thing that I think about is when we first first started going to life groups. Joe and Dolores had a life group at their home. They had a big life group. They had a, I don't remember, Joe, do you remember how many? I mean, you had a lot. You folks had a lot. It, it, was, it was a big life group. I mean, it took their whole living room with chairs lined up all around them. It was, it was phenomenal. And we, we started going to that, and it gave us the opportunity to not only grow and to be able to share some things and have people pray, it got us connected with, with other people. Joan Dolores, I had never shared how appreciative that we are for your hearts that opened up your home for us to be able to do that. How many know that that is significant, that that's needed? It just is. It made an impact on our lives. You see, we're in, a, we're in an interesting situation, church. We're so blessed to be able to meet here at the embassy, or at, at the State Theater, on Sundays, but this isn't enough, is it? We need to be able to connect more. We need to be intentional on, on being able to do community as a family. Understanding the value that we have as brothers and sisters in the kingdom of God, in God's family. We need to be able to connect, especially, especially if we want to fulfill the vision that our leader has to be impacting for this region and this community on the outside, we have to make community within us first. First. This is the part where I'm gonna put in a shameful, not ashamed to do it, plug for life groups. In fact, if one of the, one of the ushers could, could take this, what I've got here is a uh, sign, -up, sign up sheet here. Life groups, because life, is better together. You know, I've, I've said that for a number of different years and I absolutely believe that. But there's there's value in us meeting together. And if I'm gonna be, thank you, I'm to stand. But if I'm gonna be honest with you, you know, this is an area that we, that we really have kind of struggled with because we've got two scenarios that are going on and neither one of them are healthy. You know, that sign-up sheet there is for those that are willing to be able to open up their time and their resources, their house, to be able to, to host a life group. That's, that's really what, what we need first and foremost. Is we need willing people to be able to just open up their home. It doesn't mean that you need to be, be scholared in the Bible. It doesn't mean you have to go to Bible school. You just have to be willing to be able to open up and connect with one another. Right now, I think we have four active life groups. We have um, we have a marriage group that meets at our house and you know that's kind of that's kind of closed off once we start that. You know, we don't allow other married couples to come in because there's a certain kind of confidentiality and synergy that might need to take place. But then we have I think the Colmans, I don't think they're here this morning. The Colmans are, are meeting once a week at their house on Mondays. Uh, Pastor and Pastor Dar host two of them. They hosted for the student ministries on Thursdays, and then they do the Joy Club on Fridays. And that's, that's all we've got. We need more. And we're going to be campaigning the, the start of this in September, and I really need folks to be in prayerful consideration about hosting that. I'm not looking for an answer at the right now, but I am asking that you would that you would prayerfully consider the impact that you can make on creating community starting at your home. It is way more impacting than you realize. The other thing that I would challenge the rest of us as a congregation about is out of those people that are hosting, I'm going to ask you to step out of your comfort zone and sign up for a life group that maybe you wouldn't normally sign up with. One of the things that's, that's, that kind of hurts me a little bit is when I see somebody step out 
And they say, you know what, I'll, I'll be willing to host a, a life group. And they step out and, you know, that's kind of a big, big step out for some folks. And then you don't have people signing up for that because, well, maybe they aren't as well known or maybe they're not one of the pastors. Maybe we need to kind of check on what the purpose is of us wanting to do a life group and be part of it to begin with. Because it's not about recognition, it's not about getting in with, with the leadership, it's about connecting with one another. We need that connection more so than I think sometimes we realize. Point number three. But encourage one another, especially now that the day is approaching. Third point, pretty simple. Families encourage one another. Have you ever heard of the story of the group of frogs? Anybody? It's a short story. Let me read it to you. It says, as a group of frogs was traveling through the woods, two of them fell into a deep pit. When the other frogs crowded around the pit and saw how deep it was, they told the two frogs that there was no hope left for them. However, the two frogs decided to ignore what the others were saying, and they proceeded to try and jump out of the pit. Despite their efforts, the group of frogs at the top of the pit were still saying that they should just give up, that they would never make it out. Eventually, one of the frogs took heed to what the others were saying, and he gave up, falling down to his death. The other frogs continued to jump as hard as he could. And again, the crowd of frogs yelled at him to stop, the pain and just out. He jumped even harder and finally made it out. When he got out, the other frog said, did you not hear us? The frog explained it. Yeah. He thought that they were encouraging him the entire time. You know, the words that we say can have significance to other people and what they're hearing. And they and the rest of the worship team Make your way back up onto the stage this morning. I would appreciate it. But the moral of, of that story is, is the words that come out of our mouth, right? In fact, Proverbs talks about that. Life and death are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it will eat of its fruit, whether it's life or whether it's death. You know, that story really tracks very similar to a story that we find in Scripture. And I don't have time for us to turn to it this morning, but it's a story about Job, right? It's a story about a man that was in love with God. But God was bragging on Job. You know that he brags on you? You know that God boasts about you? It's hard for us to picture that sometimes, but he absolutely does. God boasts and brags on you, just like he did Job. He says, hey, if, you, if you consider my servant Job, he is so faithful in all his ways. His heart, I just, I just absolutely love where I, I mean Job. He absolutely loves you. Satan was trying to do one of his old tricks and say, you're only saying that because you've been so faithful to him, because you've given him such privilege. Look what he has. He's got a beautiful family. He's got a beautiful place to live. He's in good health. You take away that kind of stuff, forget it. He's going to drop you like tomorrow. I says, you know what? Give me your best shot. God didn't bring that on Job, just like he doesn't bring things on us. But he did want to prove a point. Job's faith. Now when you look at that story, what kind of support system did Job have? He had some friends that said, Job, oh, dude, your kids have been killed, you, you lost all of your wealth, look at your, your you got boils all over your body. You must have sinned somewhere. Come on, mess up. What happened? Where did you sin in your life? Even his own wife said, just, just curse God and die. 
Now that's quite the support system, right? That is not the kind of support system that I want to have in my life. I want people that are there to encourage me. I want people there to kind of lift me up. There's a season that I forgot about that. There was a season that I really just felt that I didn't need all of this. You see, I was allowing bitterness to be able to get into my spirit. But you know, God has been just so gracious. Even at that time where I just had that bitterness going on and I, I masked that bitterness in saying, these people are just so out there. They're causing division by what they're saying concerning the health crisis, concerning masks or no masks or politics, all of that kind of stuff. It just, it got to be just too much. It wasn't about them. It was about my heart. And God just gently spoke love and truth back into me. And then when he got done ministering to me, the Holy Spirit spoke one word to me. That was it. He said, re-engage. See, that was the part that I was missing. Jesus always went back and re-engaged. Because that's where the ministry needed to happen. See, we need each other, church. Whether we want to admit it or not. We were not intended to try and go through this life by ourselves. We are brothers and sisters in the family of God. do something just a little bit different this morning. I know it's not something that we're necessarily accustomed to doing, but I'd like everybody just to stand up and come to the front. I just really felt this in my heart. Just step out of your comfort zone. I know we're like, there's not really that much room, but you know what, let's, can we just make some room for one another? I think there's something symbolic about this this morning. We have to make room for one another, church. There's plenty of room on up. You can come on up. Don't be, don't be afraid. I promise I will try and keep the, the anointing of spit to a limited amount. Okay? birds planting, building a nest inside inside that, that fake planter. Remember that? What I didn't tell you is that a few weeks before that, that happened, there was actually a set of doves that built a nest first in that very exact same spot. You could tell that there was a difference between the nest because these doves had the material that they used, it was just kind of all over the place. I mean, they larger sticks and, and things like that. In fact, the, the doves had actually laid one, one egg inside of this nest. And I would go out into the front porch and I would, I would water the hanging baskets and this mama dove was really skittish. Every time I would walk out there, she would fly away and then she would go and perch herself on the telephone wire just kind of waiting for me to leave and she would do that morning after morning. And then one morning I happened to notice that I didn't I didn't see the I didn't see the dove. I didn't see the dove fly away and I hadn't seen it come back. And sure enough that that dove had left the nest. She actually abandoned that, that egg. She just she just gave up. I find it interesting that that the robin that chose to build a nest in the very same spot totally dismantled the old nest 
from the dumps. Totally used different material and built brand new. And you know, they gave me a picture of the heart that's been replaced. You've been given a new heart. He replaced that stony heart with a heart of flesh. He's done that for each of us. See, that old nest had some filth in it. Have you ever seen an old nest? It's kind of gross. It's got bacteria, it's got bad parasites, and all kinds of things that wouldn't be suitable for laying eggs and hatching new chicks. Those birds recognize that they needed to clean out the old before having new. There's value in assessing our toxicity level. Nikki was sharing with me a few days ago how she had to get new shampoo and new conditioner because the old shampoo and conditioner was on some kind of recall because it actually had cancerous toxins and it had some kind of formaldehyde in it even though she thought it was somewhat organic. She had to get rid of those things. She didn't continue just using those saying, oh, well, okay, Sarah, Sarah, I'm just going to go ahead and ingest these toxins. No. She was purposeful in replacing that with something that was safe. True community is God intends His family to be. If we truly are brothers and sisters, then we need to ask the Holy Spirit to just, just search our hearts, search those areas in our lives. And if there's any area in my life where there's there's toxins because of, of feelings of division, feelings of, of derision, I know God is there. I didn't want to be around anybody. Hug him all. This morning is a critical juncture for us as a family of God. We're not here to play church, are we? We're not here to come in on Sunday mornings and then go eat lunch separately at Cracker Barrel and enjoy. There's nothing wrong with those kind of things, but are we really a, a community? Are we really a family? Because families support each other. Families desire to do life together. By our love for one another. Amen. I'm going to ask you just to reach out your hand and just, just put it on somebody's shoulder. A little bit awkward, I know, right? Feels a little uncomfortable. Well, good. Well, good. just too much. I can't do a thing with them. They aren't worth it. You never did that. We have always been part of your family. From the very beginning of our creation, you purposed family. You desired family. It was us that chose to walk away. And you said, no, that's not going to happen. Not to my family. 
It doesn't matter what you go through. It doesn't matter what you did. I still love you. I still support you. You're my children. I'm going to show you exactly how much I love you. And that's what you did. Holy Spirit, I pray that we would have that same heart that the Father has. That regardless of what goes on around us, regardless of our differences of opinions or our, our bents or slants concerning politics or whatever, it doesn't matter. We are all part of the same family. We are part of your family. We are brothers and sisters in your family. God, and we commit. We commit to connecting with one another. We commit this morning that from here on out, we're going to have that purpose mindset of connecting and doing community with one another. We're going to stop playing church. God, our hearts need for you. Show us how our hearts need to be for one another as well. That just as Jesus prayed, that you and he are one, may we also have that same mindset. May we also have that same spirit to be as one as you intended us to. Church, is that your heart this morning? Thank you. 